Hi everyone, uh, as you can see I'm temporarily forced out of my usual recording space while the 3D printer is running, uh, but on the plus side you can see the rest of my uh, model collection. And that's actually a pretty good segue into the video because uh, I painted this little guy recently. Uh, it's a Zvezda uh, tank destroyer with a dog. Um, and everywhere that I posted this picture of this model, people would say, oh, isn't that the uh, anti-tank dogs that would run under their own tanks and blow them up? Um, and I actually found that I couldn't, there was nothing to link them to to read or watch or listen about this anti-tank dog program that didn't just kind of boil down to the same myths repeated over and over again. And so that's why I decided to make the video. Uh, so the, I guess, first myth is that this is a, uh, this was a program created uh, in, in desperation in 1941. Uh, and this is actually something that I believed as well until I did a little bit more digging. And it turns out that uh, this program was envisioned all the way back in the early 1930s. Uh, this was a fairly simple anti-tank weapon. Uh, you have a saddle bags on a dog that can fit 12 kilograms of explosives uh, with a lever on the back. Uh, when a dog dives under a tank or a vehicle, the lever gets hit and the dog explodes along with the tank. Uh, and this was a pretty effective weapon uh, since the belly armor of tanks those days would have been less than 10 millimeters um, and 12 kilograms was definitely more than enough of explosive to break through it. Um, and the Red Army thought so too. And so there were experiments, although at a very limited scale, there were experiments. Um, they never quite got to the battlefield, so a squad of these uh, dogs was sent to the Far East to fight the Japanese, but it was never actually deployed, uh, partially because the conditions weren't right, partially because of all the secrecy. Now, when uh, it came to the Great Patriotic War in July um, of uh, 1941, sadly, the scan the document I have is diagonal, so the, the date is cut off, but it was July 1941. Um, it suddenly turns out, hey, we have a shortage of anti-tank weapons, but we do have 3,000 of these satchels already made and ready to go. And all you have to do is train up the dogs and train up the handlers, um, which, of course, is not ideal, but in the conditions of the summer of 1941, every little bit helps. Uh, so these dogs do, in fact, start showing up on the battlefield in uh, towards closer to the fall. So I think the earliest mention I've seen was October. Uh, this is confirmed by German memoirs, uh, so they do say, you know, we've encountered these things that they call Hundenminnen, uh, dog mines, and every account uh, boils down to more or less the same thing. Uh, these Hundenminnen destroyed some of our tanks, we started shooting all the dogs we saw, uh, and then they stopped really being a problem. And this is where the pretty much every single telling uh, of the story of the anti-tank dogs ends. Uh, there might be a mention of saying, oh, you know, the dogs also ran under Soviet tanks and they were more and more trouble than they were worth. And so the whole program got canceled. Uh, I'm going to demonstrate to you today that that is not in fact true. Um, but first, let me describe how the anti-tank dogs were actually organized and how they were used. So anti-tank dogs were organized into companies. Uh, in total, you had 81 dogs. Uh, which would then be split into platoons of 27 and then squads of nine dogs. Uh, there would be a company commander overseeing the whole thing um, and then a platoon commander uh, for each platoon. So that makes um, 81 dogs, 81 handlers and four officers uh, keeping an eye on this whole business. Uh, each of the handlers was actually trained to be a tank destroyer as well. Uh, so he would have Molotov cocktails and hand anti-tank hand grenades um, and obviously a carbine for self-defense uh, to continue fighting tanks once his dog had been released. The anti-tank dogs were inherently a defensive weapon uh, because of their short range. So in defensive fighting, uh, the manual prescribed that these dogs should be uh, used in to plug holes in defenses where there weren't really any anti-tank guns or uh, tank ambushes or machine guns or anything like that, um, preferably in, in cities or, or in forests, um, where it's easier to set up an ambush. Uh, and on uh, during offensive action, these anti-tank dogs can be used as a reserve 
uh, in which case uh, two gas a trucks would be allocated uh, to carry them around. Uh, in case the enemy tries a counterattack, you can really rapidly deploy them in front of the enemy and, and block their advance. Uh, and this is where we get to the first strike against the myth. So remember how I said uh, that you can only use these dogs in places where there are no allied tanks. This is a very important factor that's repeated in the manual three or four times. Um, so theoretically, the dog should never ever even have the opportunity to strike a Soviet tank. It should never be on the same battlefield at the same time. Uh, and now the second strike against the myth is the range. So the dog was released at a maximum range of 200 meters. The manual actually said, you know, 100 to 150 uh, was probably optimal. So in order for a Soviet anti-tank dog to strike a Soviet tank, it would have to be released. Uh, the handler would have to make a mistake at a fairly short range in identification and release the dog against his own tank, which he also theoretically should never encounter in the first place. So the other aspect of the myth is that the dogs would actually go and seek out Soviet tanks because Soviet tanks smelled like diesel and German tanks smelled like gasoline. The problem with that is that only very few Soviet tanks in the summer of 1941 actually used diesel engines. So that would make VT-7M tanks, uh, T-34s, and KVs. Uh, the vast majority of the fleet was still made up of uh, BT-7s or older that used gasoline engines, T-26s, gasoline engines. Uh, to allocate these tanks to anti-tank dog training would be incredibly wasteful. Uh, in the summer of 1941, because there were so few of them, and in the fall and winter of 1941, there weren't really proportionally any more, but also these were the only tanks with the white tracks that could drive through the deep mud and the deep snow. And so if you have to train dogs, you would allocate a gasoline power tank like a T26 or BT7 or, BT or even an older model. Uh, the only document that I have that specifically lists the kind of tank um, that would be used says MS1s. So obviously a gasoline engine and a very old tank. Um, the manual from 1942 actually does say you should use a capture tank whenever possible. And 1942, uh, late 1941, early 1942 would be when the largest amount of captured, functional capture driven tanks would be available. Well, all of this is, of course, conjecture. Um, the only way we would find out whether or not these dogs uh, attack their own tanks would be through the after action reports. And this is a third strike against the myth, or fourth, I've lost count by now. Um, this is not mentioned anywhere in the after action reports. Uh, generally, this, this weapon is described as very effective if used correctly. Uh, now I'll get to what used correctly means later, uh, but there, were, there was no shortage of complaints, don't get me wrong, there was no shortage of complaints about uh, the anti-tank dog handlers being used as just regular infantry, uh, because remember, they were armed as tank destroyers and they could fight tanks on their own without their dogs. Um, the platoons being split up uh, too much, the squads being split up, uh, no reserves being allocated, uh, feeding of the dogs was being done incorrectly. So, so there was this long laundry list of complaints from everyone who used these dogs, but none of the complaints actually say these dogs ran under their own tanks. Um, of course, it's possible that this this happen. Uh, never say never, but I have not seen any documentary evidence that this ever actually happened. So, if these anti-tank dogs were such an effective weapon, how come they weren't used more often? Uh, well, here is. The problem. Remember how I said that they're only uh, they're only effective when they're used correctly. So correctly is a very long, very long word. Turns out, uh, in addition to only being able to release them um, at this very short range, the dogs also can't be in combat for very long. Uh, the nineteen forty two manual says that they should be pulled out every ten days to train. Uh, and there's a report from 1943 that I have that actually says they should pull them out twice a week to train. Um, in addition, the 1943 report says you have to change positions every 24 hours. You can't have them in one place for more than 24 hours. Uh, 
Um, and both the 42 and 43 report say that the dogs can't be used at night. And more importantly, the handlers have to stay with their dogs at night. And so you can kind of now see why the infantry commanders didn't like they don't like this because to them you have a whole squad uh, or maybe even a company of trained tank destroyers on hand that have to you know move on in 24 hours they have to keep going back to the rear lines to train um, they they have to you know have all they can be used at night they have all these caveats around their use uh, and if I had to guess I would say that the infantry commanders would just prefer to have a company of tank destroyers as opposed to a company of tank destroyer dogs. So the 1943 report actually gives a, another pretty damning caveat to the, the use of these anti-tank dogs. Uh, it says that even if you pull them out twice a week to for a fresher training um, in, in the rear of the division, this only lasts for three or four weeks. After three or four weeks, the dogs are pretty much going to forget what you taught them when you have to ship them back to the uh, Central Dog Training Academy and train them all over again. So, you know, imagine if you had uh, an anti-tank gun with a range of 200 meters uh, that you had to keep moving, moving around, you had to send it to the rear twice a week to get refitted, uh, and, and then in three or four weeks it would just expire and it's gone. Uh, you know, you wouldn't obviously consider it a very effective weapon. So one could make the argument that, fine, this, these guys, these anti-tank dogs, they had a lot of limitations on how they were used. Uh, but in 1941, when the Red Army was desperate for anti-tank weapons, well, maybe it's better than nothing. Uh, it's this, this reserve uh, that doesn't really stress the production lines. Uh, you could produce anti-tank weapons, you know, they're not great, but they're, they're, it's better than uh, just some guy, you know, with a grenade in a trench. The problem is that this reserve wasn't really infinite, um, and there was still competition for it. So dogs were used in the Red Army for a lot of different purposes. Uh, guard dogs, obviously, it's still used today. Mine, mine sniffing dogs, uh, still around. Uh, sled dogs um, to evacuate the wounded. Uh, they could be used as dispatch runners. So there was obviously a lot of demand for these trained dogs, and I can imagine that if you're in charge of the dog training academy or some kind of distribution of resources for um, these services you're not exactly thrilled where you're training up a dog that comes from a limited stock and the the worst case scenario is it, it dies in carrying out its duty and the best case scenario is three or four weeks later it just comes back to the academy and you have to do the same thing over and over again so uh i can see how that is not uh, is not an ideal use of these resources. So the final aspect of the myth is that the anti-tank dog program was cancelled in 1941. Uh, and that's actually not true. Despite all of these drawbacks to the weapon uh, that I mentioned, um, the dogs remained in service. And like I said, new instructions were being written as late as 1943. Uh, the thing is that the dogs themselves were organized slightly differently by then. So by 1943, you actually start seeing um, dog battalions rather than companies. Um, and these dog battalions would be mixed. So you would have a company of anti-tank dogs and you would have a company of mine detection dogs um, in addition to a headquarters section. Uh, so a, a little bit um, a little bit different and instead of being attached to infantry divisions they would actually be a part of the engineering service interestingly enough um, because presumably the, the mine detection dogs uh, were more useful by that point uh, these these battalions were used in the Battle of Kursk so I have a report from the 27th uh, independent anti-tank dog battalion uh, and they say that great our dogs destroyed 12 tanks in the Battle of Kursk uh, and anti-tank riflemen in our company or in our battalion only destroyed three which you know they didn't say how many riflemen they had um, but you can kind of see that the dogs did make an impact uh, unfortunately the Report does go into a lot more detail about how the tanks were destroyed with mines rather than uh, with the dogs. So not a lot of specifics about how they were used. Uh, the battalion actually wrote a report uh, for all of 1943. 
um, which illustrates why this program maybe wasn't so popular. Uh, the report says that in 1943, the entire year, uh, the battalion destroyed 21 enemy tanks. Uh, to 26 dogs were released, um, 21 enemy tanks destroyed. So percentage-wise, the weapons were, were very efficient. Uh, but as you can kind of see, for over a year, you only managed to destroy 21 tanks. And remember, an anti-tank dog company is 81 dogs. So you're releasing, you know, maybe a third, if you, a third of your battalion has fired their weapon. Uh, so third, third of your company has fired its weapon, essentially, in, in a year. Uh, and you can kind of see why this is not a very effective use of the resources. Um, and then the interesting thing is the battalion's report does say that, hey, maybe it actually makes more sense to have a separate mine detection dog battalion and a separate anti-tank dog battalion. And as far as I can tell from the documents, that sort of happened uh, on its own, uh, because in 1944 and 45, the battalion did not, even though it's still, its name was still the 27th um, Anti-Tank Dog and Mine, Sweep, uh, Mine Detection Dog Battalion, it did not actually destroy any tanks. Uh, it only was used for mine detection duty. So the, the program wasn't really cancelled, it just kind of fell away on its own. Uh, even the 1943 report readily admits that there were not really that many opportunities to use the anti-tank dogs. So as you can see, the anti-tank dogs did not go after their own tanks after all. Uh, they were a very effective weapon. Unfortunately, they were very effective in a very specific set of circumstances. Overall, this was a very costly and high upkeep, um, uh, high upkeep program. And definitely, it was more useful to have a real anti-tank gun or even anti-tank rifleman um, in your infantry division than try and uh, juggle these dogs in addition to uh, everything else you have going on at the same time. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, there was just a lot better uses for these dogs in other services than sending them in as anti-tank dogs.